Uh, they hate each other. Order, they can't Senator focus on White, Australia. We are sick of it. PM. Get over it. So, and one might guess that it is also the last day of a sitting session. Questions without notice, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. When Western Sydney woman Rolla Rad's fever got worse and her fingers and toes became swollen and started to turn blue, she called an ambulance to her home in Auburn. As she arrived at the local hospital, she found out she was positive for COVID-19. With 14 other ambulances already queuing, Rolla was sent to a makeshift tent. She was in the ambulance and the tent for a total of eight hours. Minister, is the New South Wales hospital system coping with the current COVID case levels? Obviously. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Keneally, for her question. Uh, Mr President, clearly uh, some elements of the New South Wales system uh, health system are suffering stress right now. Clearly, Mr. President. Uh, but can I say to people in New South Wales and to people in Australia generally that the Australian government has been preparing to support the Australian public health system since the beginning of the pandemic, Mr. President. Mr. President. So we began preparing in February 2020 to support the Australian health system, Mr. President. Uh, and we will continue to develop that program. Ms. Senator, Senator Keneally, I would rather take advice from the, Victor the New South Wales government, the New South Wales health system, than, than uh, someone who led the Australian Labor Party to one of the worst electoral defeats, defeats in New South Wales history, Mr President. Uh, and so Order. I will take my advice from those people who are running the, uh, who are running the health system there now and our health officials here, Mr President. So we have worked, Mr President, to increase ICU capacity nationally from 2,000 to 7,500 ventilated beds national, nationwide. We've invested over $30 billion, Mr President, in COVID health measures, Mr President, and we continue to work with the New South Wales government, Mr. President, in support of the system. We've invested over $6 billion, Mr. President, in direct COVID support to state hospitals. One of the reasons, Mr. President, we put in place the private hospitals guarantee was to support the public health system to ensure that there was capacity across the country in the case of COVID. Mr. President, and we continue to work with the states cooperatively in respect of ensuring the capacity of the public health system. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Australian Medical Association President Dr. Omar Khorshid warns, and I quote, to look after the people with COVID, we're going to compromise the care of everybody else. We are confident that we will be able to measure excess death down the track because of the impact of COVID on our broader health system. How many excess non-COVID deaths are expected as a result of higher case numbers? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and as I've already acknowledged, Mr. President, the COVID-19 global pandemic is having an impact on the health system here in Australia. Uh, it did that in Victoria last year, uh, and we invoked the private hospitals guarantee so that private hospitals could ho support the public health system in Victoria, Mr. Order. President. Uh, we will take the measures appropriate in conjunction with the New South Wales government to support the uh, public health system in order. New South Senator Wales, Colbeck, just as we did uh, in Victoria. Senator what on a point of order? Thanks, uh, Mr. President. Conscious of the time there, and we aren't even getting close to an answer to the actual question. Uh, how many so relevance? How many access? non-COVID deaths are expected as a result of higher case numbers. Okay, and I take that point, let you restate the last part of that question. There was a substantial quotation from someone before that that talked about the stress on the hospital system, I'll summarise it that way, and I'm listening carefully to the minister, but I think he's addressing that part of the question, but I'll let you remind him of your part of the question or that part of it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And I again acknowledge that there is stress on the system and that COVID-19 will continue to put stress on the system. But what we're doing, Mr President, is to work with the states 
uh, to ensure that there is capacity to support people with COVID, uh, to the extent that the private hospital guarantee ensures over 30,000 hospital beds initially nationally, the sector's 105,000 strong workforce is available, available to support Order, the public Senator health system Colbeck. to Senator manage Keneally, COVID. A final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Australian Medical Association has today declared, and I quote, a vaccination rate higher than 80 per cent of the adult population is likely to be required to avoid repeated lockdowns, giving the existing constraints on hospital capacity and staffing. Can the Morrison government guarantee that existing constraints on hospital capacity and staffing will be resolved to ensure that Australia can open up safely? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the national plan based on modelling done by the Doherty Institute, is not just about opening the economy at 70 per cent or at 80 per cent. It is about a careful, safe opening of the economy uh, so that we can ensure that the hospital system doesn't get overwhelmed, Mr President. Uh, that's the pro well, Sen Senator, if the AMA doesn't wants to be modellers, then they should go and be modellers. Uh, we, we worked with the Doherty Institute. Order. We worked with the Doherty Institute, Order. Mr. President, on my left. to do some modelling that Senator the basis Polly. of which was supporting the health order. system Senator and the what on a point of order. Thanks, Mr. President. Again, relevance. This is a really important question about whether the government can guarantee that our hospitals well, will Senator cope. Watt. That's Senator the Watt. question. Senator Watt. No, th th there was an extensive quotation again, and by talking about what he is with respect to what the minister described as the national plan, he is actually being directly relevant um, to the question. Senator Colbeck. Senator Watts' ears must be painted on, uh, Mr President, because I directly addressed the question when I said the Doherty modelling is based on safely, uh, progressively opening the economy to ensure there isn't undue pressure on the hospital system, Mr President. That's the point of the process, Mr President. I will go to the AMA for health advice. I'll go to Doherty for modelling advice. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the minister update the Senate on the implementation of the national plan agreed by National Cabinet, including in relation to regional communities and how the national plan will enable critical agricultural workers to get to work so farmers can harvest their crops? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Brockman, a proud regional Western Australian, very, very keen to support the agriculture community in your home state in particular. Well, our government's committed to supporting our farmers get through the global pandemic, getting the workers and skilled workforce they need to not just get the crop off, milk the cows, shear the sheep, and actually continue the global food tasks, not just here domestically. Uh, but to our export markets around the world. This is a $66 billion industry that we want to see continue to grow to $100 billion. And through the global pandemic, we've implemented a raft of measures as a government, providing visa extensions, relaxing the 40 hours of fortnight work limitation for student visa holders. We've established an agricultural workers' code uh, with specific states. We've established the Australian agriculture visa, uh, and we've also reopened the Pacific labour mobility programs. But we have to recognise that these measures alone will not provide the workforce that Australian agriculture needs uh, for the task ahead of it. We need to follow the national plan so that lockdowns at a local, domestic, state and international level become a thing of the past. Now, as you know, Senator Brockman, you've got a great grain growing state over there in WA. Uh, and the impact of domestic and international border closures is having a significant uh, impact on your grain growers to get the harvest off uh, that I think is taking place just in the northern wheat belt in over four weeks. And then you've got about six weeks that if we don't get these workers either from the east coast states or from internationally, because we do know uh, that there's a global workforce supply chain when it comes to grain harvesting, Canada, Ukraine, uh, right through the US, and then they end up down with us uh, because these are quite specialist uh, roles. I would ask that your Premier actually supports Western Australian grain growers by staffing Order. the Bladen Village Senator facility McKenzie and allow time for those the answer workers. Has expired. Senator Brockman, a supplementary thank question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister McKenzie, for that answer. I know Order. how engaged you are 
with agriculture right across Australia. A supplementary question. How will the national plan assist not only the agricultural industry but also other essential workforces across regional Australia? Senator McKenzie. Well, as you know, uh, Senator Brockman, through you, Mr President, State and territory chief ministers and premiers have agreed with the Prime Minister to a national plan that will see freedom of movement of people, lockdowns end when it's safe to do so, following the very, very best medical evidence and advice. And it is very, very concerning that there are leaders in this country and chief Order. medical officers uh, perpetuating this Order myth my of zero cases and an elimination Order. strategy is the way out of a global pandemic. Well, I would ask them to pick up a year eight science textbook because that is actually not achievable. And to actually have a plan mapped out using the very best science and health data uh, to make sure that agriculture and regional communities can have the workforces they need to not just grow great clean green product, but to actually Order. support the mining industry and the manufacturing industry uh, is a crime, an absolute crime. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Brockman, a final Thank supplementary you, question. Mr President. What are the risks Australia faces if the outcomes under the national plan are not achieved, and how would this impact regional communities and the livelihoods of people who live and work there? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Well, Senator Brockman, you know that uh, we've got a shortage of workers right throughout regional Australia. Um, the, job, the job ads go on and on, and it's not just fruit pickers we need. It is actually sustainable, high-paid careers out in rural and regional Australia. Uh, so we need workforce, not just from capital cities, not just uh, from other states, but Order. internationally. And there is only one way out of this global pandemic to give regional and rural Australia the workforce that they need, the access to global markets that they need to grow and prosper, and that is through the national plan. States and your home state, I'm sorry to say, Senator Brockman, has a very, very poor vaccination rate. We have to, as leaders, as leaders in our country. Order. Well, I'll take the interjections. I'll take the interjections from Senator Pratt. Five Order, Senator billion McKenzie. dollar surplus. Time Fix for your own hospitals. The answer has expired. Senator Muriel Smith. Order. Senator Muriel Smith is asking a question remotely, so I need to be able to hear it. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. This week, a major incident alert was issued for two South Australian hospitals struggling to cope with pressure on emergency departments. And emergency doctors at the Women's and Children's Hospital warned urgent action was needed before the system fails completely. The SA Salaried Medical Officers Association has said, and I quote, can you imagine now if we had COVID in this environment? It's just mind blowing what we won't be able to do if COVID comes into South Australia. Can the Morrison-Joyce government guarantee that hospitals in South Australia will be properly resourced to cope with the increased demand of going into the next phases of the national plan with high case numbers? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Smith for her question. Um, Mr President, funding contributions from the Commonwealth for public hospitals in all states and territories has grown substantially since we came to government in 2012-13. From 13.3 billion Order. to 25.5 billion in 1920, a growth of, Mr President, 92 per cent, 92 per cent growth since we came to government. And as I've indicated earlier today in the chamber, preparation to support the public health system through COVID commenced in February of last year. We have already invested over $6 billion in support to state hospitals for COVID. Six, over $6 billion, Mr President. We've established telehealth and GP respiratory clinics to ease pressure on hospitals and state workforces. We've created the Private Hospitals Partnership called the hospitals, private hospitals viability guarantee, Mr President. And that provides a 100 per cent contribution from the Commonwealth to support that measure. 
It provides for the integration of private hospitals with state and territory health systems to ensure over 30,000 additional health beds and the sector's 105,000 strong skilled workforce is available alongside the public health system to support it in the event of COVID outbreak, Mr President. And we continue to evolve and work on all of the issues that we need to do to support the public health system. And of course, as I've said, the Doherty modelling and the national plan is about m mitigating uh, cases and controlling a safe opening to support the health Order, system in the Senator Australian Colbeck. community. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. AMA President Dr Omar Khorshid wrote to Mr Morrison warning, and I quote, if we throw open the doors to COVID, we risk seeing our public hospitals collapse. Is the President of the Australian Medical Association correct? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. The issue in that statement is if we throw open the doors, and that's not the plan, Mr President. That is not the plan. It's all very well. You need to make up your mind, Senator, whether you support the plan or not, because I tell you, on this side, there's serious questions as to whether Labor actually Order. support the plan or not. Order. Do Labor support the plan? Do Labor support Order. the plan? You've got the Premier of Queensland who clearly doesn't support the plan. He's more interested in fighting the federal election than supporting Australians through COVID, Mr President. A three-year-old child can't go and see their, their mum and dad because of the approach Order. that the Labor Party is taking in Queensland, Mr Senators President. It is outrageous, right. Mr President. NRL players can Order. go. NRL players and their wives can go. A three-year-old child can't go to Queensland to see their parents, Mr President. It is completely outrageous what is being proposed. So Labor need to make up their mind. Do they support the national plan Order. or not? Order. Senator Smith, the final supplementary question. Dr Khorshid has also warned, and I quote, too often we hear tragic stories of late stage cancer diagnosis, emergency treatment delayed, and sadly avoidable deaths, all resulting from an overworked system. This is only going to get worse with COVID. Can the minister guarantee no Australian will suffer a late stage cancer diagnosis, emergency treatment delay or avoidable death as a result of increasing demand from COVID? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I've said a number of times, the process that we're going through is to carefully open the economy using the national plan in the stage process so that we can also protect the public health system. And we've put other measures in place also to support the public health system as that process continues. I've also acknowledged, Mr President, I have also acknowledged that COVID-19 will place stress on the health system. And that is going to have an effect across the health system. For Labor to pretend that it's not is dishonest. It is dishonest, which is, which, is a, which is a bit of a trait, Mr President, Order. because they dishonestly pretend that effects may or may not happen if they were in charge, when in fact they would, Mr President. We are dealing with a global pandemic here, Mr President, and there will be effects. Unfortunately, there will be effects. We have a plan to deal with it. Labor have no plan, and we're not sure if they actually support the plan that we have. Senator, order, order. It is likely to be Senator Seawood's last question. So, Senator Seawood. Yes, Mr President, so I'm expecting a really good answer. <laughs> my question to you, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin. Hundreds of thousands of people are living below the poverty line through lockdown in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. Last year, your government recognised that people on income support needed additional assistance during lockdowns. Most people on income support are not getting additional support during the current lockdowns. Why not? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Oh, thank you very much, Mr President. And can I say, um, Senator Seawood, it's a tremendous, uh, um, tremendous honour to be actually receiving your last question. Uh, you have been an extraordinary member of this parliament, um, and, uh, and I thank you very much for your question and your continued interest 
in, uh, in advocating on behalf of some of our more vulnerable members of the Australian community. Uh, well, Senator Seward, um, last year, as you would be aware, when Australia went into lockdown, um, when the pandemic first hit, we were in a, a very, very vastly different situation than we currently are. We had no certainty at all around what was about to happen, and the government acted very, very quickly to throw a blanket over the whole of Australia in the hope that we could give Australians confidence to get through what was a very, very dark time for our country. This year we have unfortunately seen uh, a second round of, uh, of uh, COVID-19 impact parts of our country. So what we have sought to do is to be particularly targeted in our response to people in lockdown areas who have been impacted by a loss of hours uh, as a result of pandemic lockdowns. Uh, the first measure was to make sure that anybody who had lost ours was immediately able to have access to the COVID-19 disaster payment that's administered through emergency uh, services through Senator McKenzie's department. Um, subsequent to the initial um, allocation of the COVID-19 disaster payment to people who were working and had lost ours, we also extended it to those people who were on uh, income payments who also had lost work, recognising that those people, uh, we did not want those people to actually be going out and seeking to work because we needed to try and contain the virus in the states uh, that were in lockdown. Um, but in addition to that, we have also maintained um, you know, support across the whole of the community. But Senator uh, Seward, as you would know, and having listened to the numerous answers that have been provided in this place by Senator Colbeck, Vaccinations Order. are the way we can get Senator our country Rushton. safe Senator again. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Through you, Mr President. Um, Minister, most people on income support in lockdown are not receiving any additional payments and are living below the poverty line. Do you acknowledge that this, this puts them at greater risk during the pandemic, particularly if they have to go out to find work because they are living below the poverty line? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, of course, Senator C, what you and I have had many discussions in relation to um, the, um, the payments that are received by Australians who require the support of the Australian welfare system, um, and, in, and constantly in discussion around uh, the issue of the measurement of poverty. What I would say is the Australian welfare system is a very comprehensive and targeted system that seeks to provide support to individuals that reflects their particular circumstances and their particular needs. And that is why we do not just talk about the Australian welfare system as their pri the primary payment that is received by a recipient, but about all of the other things that are provided. Obviously, with families, family tax, a tax benefit. Those people that are renting, obviously, rental assistance. But we also have a universal system of healthcare and education and many non-cash transfer payments so that we can make sure that our non-contributory, <laughs> non-time-limited welfare system targets people and the needs of the individual. Senator Sea, with a final supplementary question. How can you be safe and stay at home if you have to go out to scrape some money together because you are living below the poverty line. Does not the fact that people are living below the poverty line mean they are at greater risk? You didn't answer that the first time. I'll ask it again. Senator Rustin. Uh, look, thank you very much, Senator Seward. Um, the government remains absolutely committed to supporting all Australians, whether that be under normal times, under our normal um, welfare system, or whether that be under the extraordinary times that we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, we recognise um, that um, supporting Australians needs to be targeted, as I mentioned to you before. I mean, we will continue to disagree in relation to the definition of poverty and how it applies to Australia's welfare system. But the one thing that we do need to, uh, I would like to, to reinforce is that Australia's welfare system is non-contributory. You do not have to have worked and paid into the scheme to be able to get access to it. You do not need, uh, you, for, it was there for as long as you need. It is not time limited like other schemes around the world. But we also need to make sure that our welfare system, whilst being fair to the people that it needs to support, we also need to be fair to the people who pay for it, the taxpayer. We try and balance balance those two things to support people but make sure that it's sustainable into the future. Order. Senator Polly. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. How many days is it since the Morrison Joyce government failed to meet its own Easter target 
for vaccinating and I, and I emphasise all <coughs> aged care workers. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, Senator Polly, through her question, continues the dishonesty of the Labor Party in prosecuting uh, the discussion around this particular matter, order. Mr. President. I have Senator, Senator Colbeck. I have Senator Polly on a point of order. Uh, it's relevant. The question was very specific. It was how many days. Since the Morrison Joyce okay, government Senator, said it's Senator own Polly, I, I, target Senator Polly, date. Um, I do take points of order on, on direct relevance. Um, I called the minister to order, I think, at 12 seconds and 13 seconds. So I'm going to listen to his answer. You've made your point of Yes, Senator Polly? I just re uh, would draw your attention to the word of accusation that I've been dishonest, I thought was unparliamentary, and I draw your attention uh, to it. The way I heard it, the way, if I could, if I could rule, the way I heard it, and if I'm incorrect, I will ask Senator Colbeck to withdraw. He referred to the Labor Party with that term. Um, well, I, I didn't hear that. Um, I will rely upon the minister, if he did say it, to withdraw it. If not, I'll check the Hansard. But I was listening quite carefully when I heard the term. If I'm wrong, I apologise in advance. Can I urge senators again, this happened another time in debate, um, if we avoid the use of terms, uh, then we avoid getting into unparliamentary language. And if we avoid interjections, we also stay more relevant to questions. Senator Colbeck to continue. Mr President, and Labor being dishonest not only in their, in their points of order, Mr President, but they, are being dis, they, but they are being dishonest in their representation of the issue, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, we did, we did uh, set ourselves an objective with respect to vaccination of the aged care workforce. But we received advice from the health professionals that we not vaccinate residents and workforce at the same time, Mr President. I've, I've, I've put that information on the table yep. so many times in this chamber. I know that Labor are living in the past, Mr President. I know that they're only interested in fighting us and not helping us fight the virus. But, Mr President, we received health advice not to vaccinate residents and staff at the same time. Order. We, we, and we took that advice, Mr President. We then, through the Age PPC and through National Cabinet, set a target date of the 17th of September for all aged care workers to have received a first dose. Order, we are on track Watt. to meet that target, Mr President. We will continue to work to that objective. I had a webinar with, that was open to every aged care provider and their infection control lead this morning to talk to them about the target and the processes that we're going to, the advice that we could assist them with and, and the channels that were available to them to get their workforce vaccinated. <coughs> this is an important measure, Mr President. Uh, we continue to work on it. Uh, we are determined to meet our objective and we continue to work cooperatively with the sector and the unions, I might add, in that course, Mr President. Uh, so we continue to work to support people in, Australia, in the aged care sector in Australia. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Mr Morrison conceded this week that there were still challenges in the aged care vaccine rollout. Was Mr Morrison referring to the approximately 60,000 aged care workers who remain unvaccinated with the September 17th deadline just weeks away? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, a further example of the Labor Party living in the past. Uh, very, very old data, Mr. President. Uh, we, and, and we continue to publish the data, Mr. President. It's available on the website. We've actually put on, we've actually put on the website every single aged care facility in this country, Mr. President. Every single aged care in this facility in this country, so people can have a look and see what their vaccination rate is. That's transparency, Mr. President. That's working with the sector to understand what's going on. And that's why, Mr President, I spent time this morning with, uh, on a webinar open to every aged care provider in Australia and their infection control lead to work them through any issues they might have in achieving their objective and our objective, Mr President. Their objective. It's not right, Senator. It's not right, Senator. Your numbers Order. are wrong. You're living in the past, Order. Senator. Mr. President, and we will continue to work, Mr. President, with the sector cooperatively to ensure that we get there. 
Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, with approximately 60,000 aged care workers still unvaccinated, will the minister today guarantee that the Morrison Joyce government will meet the September 17th target? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, Senator Polly's numbers are wrong. Uh, Mr. President, uh, and, and as I've indicated a number of times, we are determined to meet our objective, uh, and we know that the aged care sector and the unions, Mr. President, are happy to work with us. Well, if that's what the, if that's the answer you want, ask the question, Senator. You can't even get your questions Order. right. It's just Order. absurd, Mr. President, what the Labor Party are tossing up here at the Order. moment, Mr. President. That, so we continue to work with. We continue to work, Mr. President, with the sector to get the, um, the workers vaccinated. And as of this morning, 83.4% uh, of the aged care sector have had a first dose. 62% have Senator, had a se Senator second dose, Mr. Colbeck, President. I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Mr. President, on relevance, the question is very clearly whether the minister will guarantee that the government will meet its target. And while I'm on my feet, I might also ask if you could just review the transcript. Uh, in relation to the dishonesty point I will, earlier. I'm very happy to, and if I'm wrong, I said, I, as I said, I apologise in advance. Um, can I say, with respect to the point of order, that was the second part of the question. Um, I can't instruct a minister to use a word or not, but the first part of the question contained an assertion about a number and a statistic that the minister is challenging, and he is entitled to do that in, in, and be directly relevant to a question. Uh, he's not entitled to stray from the topic, but he is allowed to challenge it. Senator Colbeck. Well, order. If we don't have interjections, there's so no Mr. need President, to respond to Senator them. Thank Keneally you, Senator Colbeck. I didn't give any data, and I've just said, Mr. President, that 83.4 per cent of the aged care workforce have had a first date, first vaccination. It's not a number. 62 per cent. 62 per cent have had a second dose, Mr. President. Order, Senator Colbeck. Mr. Perhaps Senator Polly on a point of order. The minister is still <coughs> avoiding their main question. Was are you going Sen to Senator guarantee Polly, that those Senator Polly, aged please care resume workers, your seat. I have repeatedly said that points of order must start with a standing order, rather than simply accusing someone of not answering a preferred part of the question in a preferred manner. Senator Colbeck, do you wish to continue? Thank you, Mr. President. And we will continue to work with the aged care sector with the objective of, in, of vaccinating the entire order, workforce. Senator by Colbeck, the of time for the answer has expired. Remotely, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Senator, my question references independent professional truckies who protested Monday morning in Queensland. Can the Attorney General inform the Senate of the legal protections afforded Australians under our constitution, legislation, common law, or international conventions that protect the right of everyday Australians to engage in peaceful protest in a public place. Order. Se the order, Senator Watt. The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Roberts for the question. And Senator Roberts, in relation to the actual legal provisions, I don't have them with me, so I will need to revert uh, to you in relation to that. But in terms of the right to peacefully protest in this country, uh, it is a right that we do hold dearly, and certainly as a society order. and as a government, uh, it is something. Uh, that when people do protest, and we've seen protests around Australia, uh, in particular during COVID-19, uh, that they do adhere to the law Senator at Watt. all time and certainly respect the rights of others in relation to what they are protesting on. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. After the truckies made their excellent point that Senator Hanson and I support, Senator Hanson did ask the truckies to consider allowing horses on trucks in the blockaded traffic to be freed and allowing everyday Australians to go about their day without hindrance. Attorney General, do you agree that the Australian people would be looking to parliaments to defend civil, civil liberties exercised in a fair manner, not to trash them? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, uh, Senator Roberts, at all times, uh, when people are protesting, and it doesn't matter what the issue is in relation to a protest, they should always protest in accordance with the law. They should respect the laws of the land, and at all times, they should respect the rights of others. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Thank you. I note that previous protests against COVID measures around our nation were deemed illegal and prosecuted. Yet the Black Lives Matter protests were approved under COVID restrictions. Both series of protests were in violation of similar COVID restrictions. 
The only difference between those two protests was the subject matter. Attorney General, should politicians be allowed to use public order, order measures to hide from public criticism? Um, the, the minister said they couldn't hear the question because of in, um, noise during a remote question. So I'm going to ask Senator Roberts to ask it again, um, which I know wastes the time of the chamber, but the minister couldn't hear it. So I asked for silence. Senator Roberts, can you repeat your question? Certainly, Mr. President. I note that previous protests against COVID measures around our nation were deemed illegal and prosecuted, yet the Black Lives Matter protests were approved under COVID restrictions. Both series of protests were in violation of similar COVID restrictions. The only difference between these two protests was the subject matter. Attorney General, should politicians be allowed to use public order measures to hide from public criticism? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Robert, again, Commonwealth, state and territory governments, uh, the one thing we are all united in is keeping Australians safe during COVID-19. Uh, and the Australian government has at all times sought to take measures that combat the virus, but as I said previously, at the same time respecting people's rights and their freedoms. You would also know that states and territories themselves have taken measures under their own laws in respect of COVID-19. And as you have articulated, this is predominantly done under state and territory public health and emergency management legislation. Uh, again, at all times, though, you know, the Commonwealth will work with state and territory governments through the National Cabinet to ensure that Australia's COVID-19 response is one that is measured and is one that is appropriate. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Uh, Minister, with the National Summit on Women's Safety starting on Monday and roundtables starting today, can you explain how the summit will support our government's goal to reduce violence against women and children? Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. Um, well, the National Summit on Women's Safety is an absolute critical step in the development of the next national plan, not just to reduce violence against women and their children, but to end it once and for all. And the plan must be an ambitious blueprint to wipe out the scourge that is domestic violence on our national landscape. The first plan uh, began in 2010, and since then we've developed a, a much larger body of evidence and a better understanding about the ways domestic violence is perpetrated. Our understanding of violence against women has changed since the first plan came into effect, and that's what we seek to understand through these roundtables. We know that uh, domestic, family and sexual violence is pervasive and it takes many different forms. Uh, today and tomorrow, the roundtables will consider all of those different forms of violence, things such as coercive control, technology facilitated abuse, and the impact of violence that it has in the home on children. Participants uh, in the roundtables include survivors, frontline service workers, and people who deal with domestic, family, and sexual violence every single day in their line of work. So, together with the Minister for Women, a number of my colleagues, members in this place, members in the other place, from all parties in, these, uh, in, in this uh, parliament um, have been observing these roundtables so that we can hear directly, firsthand, from people, often survivors, of these different types of, of domestic family and sexual violence, so that we can make sure, as we develop the next national plan to end violence against women and their children, that we have got the voices of people who have survived this abuse firmly embedded into our decision making. But importantly, the summit also gives the opportunity for all Australians to have their say and to be involved um, by um, the live streaming, because we want to have a public debate to end this scourge Order. on our society. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Uh, and Minister, you spoke about the next national plan to end violence against women and their children. Uh, can you please explain to us how this next national plan will consider the needs of our diverse community in Australia? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, family, domestic and sexual violence is a scourge that's across the entire Australian landscape. And we know that it doesn't matter where you live, how old you are, where you've come from, whether you're a first Australian or a new Australian, your socioeconomic status, you can be affected by family, 
domestic and sexual violence. We also recognise that some women are more likely to experience violence than others, uh, and some have greater barriers to accessing critical support services. This morning we began a series of roundtables um, that will form part of that consultation, hearing this morning from representatives from the LGBTIQIA community as well as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. We also had a roundtable to interact uh, on issues around perpetrators and making sure that we've got early intervention programs so that we can get in early and stop the violence. Um, the discussion is well underway, and I'd really like to acknowledge the huge number of people that are participating in their roundtables, some of them under very traumatic Senator situations. Davey, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. And how will the National Summit on Women's Safety address this really important issue of sexual violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we um, have included sexual violence in the plan this time for the first time because we absolutely believe and are committed to reducing sexual violence and harassment in Australia to ensure women and girls of all ages can be safe at work, safe at home, safe when they're studying, safe when they're online. And preventing and responding to sexual violence will be a key to discussion at the National Summit with expert panellists, including this year's Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, Women's Safety New South Wales CEO Hayley Foster and the University of New South Wales Associate Professor Dr Michael Salter. The panel will inform the plan and ensure sexual violence is absolutely at the forefront of ending violence against women once and for all. This work builds on the $29 million to, prevent, uh, to develop new primary prevention initiatives to address sexual violence, which will now allow targeting resources uh, to campuses of universities and build on our very successful Stop It At The Start campaign. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Environment Minister. It has been revealed under FOI today that the Morrison government directed independent science agency Ames to, report, to release a report into the health of the Great Barrier Reef before the report was complete. This, of course, was to be used for political lobbying ahead of the UNESCO vote on the danger of the reef. Will the minister tell the parliament who gave the direction for this early release? Was it the environment minister or her office, or did the direction come from the top and it was the prime minister and his office that was interfering with the scientific report? Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Hanson-Young, for your question, and I apologise for getting your name incorrect earlier. Um, but can I uh, just scratch my head and say, first of all, that I'm not entirely sure what the outrage is about, because it seems that the Greens and the ABC are in quite a lather, not because the, the report was withheld, not because it was altered, but because it was, in fact, released. This is bewildering. So we released it, and we released it a week after its key findings were already published, already published in an op-ed by Ames themselves. So hold the front page on that one. The Minister for the Environment welcomes that report from the Australian Institute of Marine Science that shows that after a series of severe and widespread disturbances over the last decade, coral cover has actually increased across all regions. Now, these results are an outstanding demonstration of how the reef can actually recover following disturbances if given enough time to make that recovery. These reports have been released annually since 2016, so they should come as no surprise. And 2016, after that mass bleaching event, and they are, apps, they are the most comprehensive record of reef condition that's available for the Great Barrier Reef. Now, as much as these results are good news in the short term, they don't change the need for our ongoing, highly regarded reef management and strong global action on climate change to improve the outlook of the reef in the long term. So this program is part of the Australian government's $3 billion commitment to protecting the reef and support the work of reef communities, reef managers and marine scientists, traditional owners and, of course, the thousands of Australians who depend on the reef economy. Australia is world-leading in our coral reef science and management, and we readily share our findings and our expertise at a global level. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, isn't it true, Minister, that the reason the Environment Minister was so desperate to get this report out before it was finished 
and spent so much time and money lobbying the UN members was because they are, the government was desperate to cover up how poorly you have taken climate action. You are embarrassed about your poor performance. Order. Senator Hanson Young. Well, I can't hear over Senator Sazelja, well, even though he's got a mask Sen on. Senator, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hanson Young, have you concluded your question? I've concluded my question. Senator Hume. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I reject both the premise of Senator Hanson Young's question and the undergraduate tone with which it was di it was directed. Did the government direct an independent science agency to release a report early? Is that seriously what you are suggesting? The AIM's chief science executive, Paul Hardesty himself, has already made it clear that any suggestion that this report was rushed is entirely incorrect. The technical report was already finished. The document only needed to be prepared for publication, which required it to be formatted and laid out for publication. But the key findings of that report had already been finalised and, in fact, published, published and publicised in an op-ed by the CEO of Ames on the 12th of July. That was before the government requested the report's release to provide to the World Heritage Committee. I am afraid, Senator Hanson Young, you are poorly mistaken. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Th thank you, Mr. President. UN head. Antonio Guterres has declared the IPCC report a code red for climate, and he's urged countries to do more to reduce both car carbon pollution and protect biodiversity in the fight against the climate collapse. When will this government take seriously the emergency we're facing of the collapse of the climate and the biodiversity crisis? When will you have proper targets for 2030 ahead of the end of year Order, COP Senator conference? Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hume. <laughs> Order. <laughs> Senator Hume. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. President. And I want to reiterate the fact that the Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage Great Barrier Reef, and we make no apologies for that, or for defending our reputation as the best marine park managers in the world. We are benchmarked against global standards, and Australia's management of the reef is recognised as a leading example and is considered by many to be the gold standard for large-scale marine protected area management, according to a UNESCO report. And that fact is in fact acknowledged by many, including the World Heritage Centre itself. In its draft decision on the reef presented to this year's World Heritage Committee meeting, it said that the state party, referring to Australia, for the, it, it commended the state party, Australia, for the strong and continued efforts to create the conditions for the implementation of the Reef 2050 long-term sustainability plan, and that included through unprecedented financial commitments. This is the centrepiece of Australia's reef protection efforts, the 2050 Hume, plan jointly Senator defended by the Queensland government. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. As a result of vaccine supply shortages, the New South Wales government has been forced to extend the gap between the first and second doses of Pfizer vaccines to eight weeks. What impact will this change resulting from a shortage of vaccine supplies have on the time frame of reaching the 70 and 80 per cent targets? And did the New South Wales government advise the Morrison-Joyce government of this change before it was announced? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can I say I reject the premise of the question that there is a vaccine shortage? Mr President, uh, there are significant volumes of vaccines available to Australians. In fact, if someone wants to go out and get they say that they say they support the vaccine rollout program. They say they say that they support both vaccines, but the scoffing from across the chamber belies belies that, Mr. President, and they're only focused on Pfizer uh, and they're not Order. concerned about AstraZeneca, which is uh, done a large proportion of the work, Mr. President, in the system, Mr. President, uh, and, and noting that they've actually shortened the time frame for doses between of, of the AstraZeneca vaccine, Mr. President, to pr promote the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. Uh, and we've supported New South Wales in respect 
of their vaccine rollout by putting 50 per cent of the additional vaccines that we got from Poland, 500 plus thousand doses, into New South Wales to support the rollout. We distributed the rest of that across the vaccine rollout to the states on a per capita basis, Mr. President. So we have and we will continue to support states in respect of the vaccination program, Mr. President. And today, Mr. President, today, Mr. President, we have passed 20 million doses. A significant effort, Mr. President. The Labor Party should be celebrating that, Mr. Order. President. Order, Senator they... Colbeck, no, Senator hear. Watt, on a point of order. Thanks, Mr. President. Again, on relevance, uh, we would like this minister to answer questions such as what impact well, the change no, the government— no, There's no such as, Senator Watt. Well, the, OK, um, specifically the question is what impact the was, change announced by the New South Wales part, government will have on— and that, and that was one of the questions. Oh, sorry, Senator Cash. Thank you. And on the point of order in relation to relevance, the minister was directly relevant. The first response he made was, I reject the premise of the question. Um, firstly, Senator Watt, order. Senator, Sen Senator Watt, If I could rule. Um, that was one question among several asked um, to address, uh, or there were, with a preface. And a, um, a minister cannot simply reject the premise of a question and say everything they want. They still must remain directly relevant to the material in the question. Um, I'm listening carefully to the minister. Um, as I heard him, he was talking about vaccine supply. Um, it's not a place for a general address on the vaccine rollout program. But if he's talking about matters raised in the question, I believe he's directly relevant. I can't instruct him how to answer it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And we will continue to support New South Wales and other states with respect to the vaccine rollout, Mr President. In fact, um, to date, as I've indicated, 20 million, 28,084 doses of vaccine across the country have been administered, Mr President. Uh, and of course, both vaccines, not just Pfizer, Mr President, both vaccines are playing an important part in the rollout. So, yes, Mr. President, there are different, day, different time periods in different states between doses. Victoria has extended their doses out to six weeks rather than three weeks for Pfizer. Order, uh, Senator Colbeck. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Will the New South Wales government's decision to extend the gap for Pfizer vaccines from three weeks to eight weeks? force those who've already booked their appointments to wait longer. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. If someone has a booking for a vaccination, Mr President, I would urge them to keep it. And I would urge anyone who wants to take up a vaccine, Mr President, to make a booking to take up a vaccination, Mr President. There is ample supply of AstraZeneca available right now. Right now, in fact, Mr. President, order. Senator, there are, I've got. I had Senator O'Neill on her feet first. Senator O'Neill on a point of order. Yes, and it's with regard to relevance. The question was pretty straight, and it did not refer to AstraZeneca. It's a particular question about the rollout of Pfizer, the three to eight week delay, and I urge you to bring the minister actually to the question in hand. Um, it, it was a relatively specific question. Was the word Pfizer mentioned in the question? In this in the supplementary. OK, my notes, sorry, I didn't have that. I try and scribble as quickly as I can. Um, in, this is a specific question. I'm going to ask the minister to specifically address the issues in the question. But again, I cannot instruct the minister the terms in which to answer a question, the terminology to be used, or the content of the answer. So this question goes to the, um, the extension, in my view, of the time period for the vaccine. Um, I, I, I take it I didn't have Pfizer, but I take your word for it, Senator O'Neill. And it goes to um, whether or not people will have to wait longer, or whether or, uh, or any other arrangements relative to both of those the minute that, I, that are directly relevant. Senator Cash, are you seeking the call? Thank you. And on the point of order in relation to relevance, uh, Mr. President, you are right. The question was in relation to the New South Wales government's decision to extend. Um, bookings in relation to Pfizer, and will people have to wait longer yeah. for a vaccination? 
the minister is directly referring Look, to yeah. directly referring to whether or not people have to wait longer. We're not, Senator Keneally, we're not going to get into whether there are two words in it because I heard the interjection there. I'll take your submission. Thank wait. you, Mr. President. I do appreciate that. The question was actually, would it force those who've already booked their appointments to wait longer? It didn't go to whether people should book or not book. It went to directly the question of people who've already got appointments yeah. booked for I, Pfizer. I, I, I appreciate it did not go to. It's not the place for a general discussion of whether someone should book for a vaccine. But at the same time, a tightly worded question and answer can still be directly relevant by addressing the issues raised in the question, even if it is not addressed in the terms the opposition would like. That is what the motions to take note are for afterwards. So I call Senator Colbeck, taking all that into account, to continue. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, I would urge anyone who's got a a vaccine appointment to keep that appointment. One, anyone who doesn't have one to make one, Mr. President. The Labor Party want to make this all about Pfizer, but the vaccine rollout is not just about Pfizer, Mr. President. There are two vaccines Order. currently in our vaccination program, and Mr. President, and there are ample supplies of AstraZeneca available right now. To date, Mr. President, we have we have received 32.7 million doses of vaccine, 14.5 million order. doses Senator of Colbeck, Pfizer, Mr. President. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Relevance. This is nowhere near the question that Labor has asked. Um, well, I ask you to bring respect, the minister back I to the question. I do not think that to be directly relevant to an answer, a brand or manufactured version of a vaccine is going to meet is I can apply that as a strict test. If the minister is the minister is directly addressing the issues in the question, there is an opportunity to take note. On my right, I think order. I think, with respect, the submission that I instruct the minister to speak about one brand of vaccine is actually going beyond direct relevance and actually seeking, to direct, seeking me to direct him how to answer a question. Senator Keneally. And thank you, Mr President. I appreciate the point you're making, but this goes to a decision in the New South Wales government that is directly relevant to just one brand of the vaccine. We didn't have an option to ask about other brands. The New South Wales government and, made this decision. And there's a chance to debate the merits of it. And it is a simple answer. question uh, that, if people uh, will uh, have actually, to wait. No. There is an opportunity to debate the merits of how a minister answers a question. Direct relevance does not go to using the very words raised in a question, or in this case, the brand. Um, if he's, you have an opportunity to debate that afterwards, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And the Labor Party directly, directly contribute to vaccine hesitancy by by their dismissal of AstraZeneca, Mr. President. We have two vaccines in our vaccination program. Order, Pfizer Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Every... Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and I'm sure it will disappoint, disappoint New South Wales men and women who couldn't get Pfizer. That answer—it's just terrible. Despite the 107 tragic deaths in the current Delta outbreak, 957 people in hospital and 160 in the ICU. The Morrison-Joyce government is forcing people in New South Wales to wait an additional five weeks to be fully protected from COVID. Does the Morrison-Joyce government take responsibility for failing vaccine supply, or does Mr Morrison maintain that ultimately everything is a state matter? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr President. And, and, and despite all their protestations, Mr President, clearly the Labor Party continue to attempt to undermine the confidence of the Australian community in vaccines, particularly AstraZeneca, and it's not the first time Senator O'Neill has done that this week with her scoffing across order. the chamber when, with order. the mention of Senator AstraZeneca. Senator Colbeck, I have Senator O'Neill on a point of order. Senator O'Neill. To assist the minister, I just want him to know that I got oh, AstraZeneca. I do support um, that, the rollout, but Senator I want Pfizer for people who need seat. it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. There are 32.7 million doses of vaccine that have been made available in the Australian community since the beginning of the vaccine rollout. 14.5 million doses of Pfizer, 18.2 million do doses of AstraZeneca. I thank every, of the, every one of the people who have taken up the 20 million doses that have currently been put into arms. I urge every Australian to take up the opportunity to take, up, to, to take a vaccine of whatever variety is available to them, Mr President, because that is what is going to make us safe against the COVID-19 virus. Senator Scar. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Australia's passionate Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on the wonderful achievements of our Australian para athletes at the Tokyo Paralympics? The minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Scar for his question. Australia, Mr. President, sent a team of 179 athletes and 168 support staff to the Tokyo Paralympics. They have represented our nation with distinction, uh, as we've seen with pride, and their performances on the world's greatest stage have brought immense joy to many Australians over recent weeks in what's been a very challenging time. Mr. President, Australia's para athletes put in significant effort in preparing for the Olympics, just like their Olympic counterparts. The Commonwealth Government is currently the major funding source for Paralympic sports. In the five years leading to the Tokyo Paralympics, the Government has provided $88.8 million for para-athlete high-performance programs. The Government recognises, however, that there is a disparity in, these, um, in payments available to uh, Australian medal-winning athletes compared in the Paralympics compared to the medal-winning athletes in the Olympic Games. Medal incentives are currently paid by the Australian Olympic Committee to Olympic medal-winning athletes. The governing body of Parasports Australia, Paralympics Australia, does not have the financial capacity to do the same for Paralympic medal-winning athletes, Mr President. And that is why I am absolutely delighted to advise the Chamber that the government has decided to make available funding to Paralympics Australia, which would allow it to make payments to medal winning athletes at the Tokyo Paralympics, equivalent to the payments, Mr President, made to, by the AOC to medal winning athletes at the Tokyo Olympics. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. How have Australians reacted to the performances of our para-athletes in Tokyo, including in relation to the wonderful Queenslander Grant Scooter Patterson, who, after winning a medal, said, and I quote, I'm living proof that if you follow your dreams long enough, they might come true. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Senator Scar, there have been some absolutely wonderful stories um, out of the Paralympics, and I'm sure over the coming days there'll be many more to come. Uh, Australia's medal tally to date is 13 gold, 23 silver, and 24 bronze, a total of 60 medals thus far, and I'm sure there'll be more over the next few days. Importantly, our team has competed with the pride that you've expressed and represented our nation uh, with so much pride and capacity. Chef de Mission Kate McLaughlin put it perfectly when she said earlier this week, the culture of the Australian Paralympic team is shining through at a time when it's been severely tested. I couldn't be prouder of the way that everyone has risen to the occasion. Mr President, can I echo her comments? And I'm sure the rest of Australia would do exactly the same. Senator Scar, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the Liberal National Government assisting our para-athletes to achieve their goals, including as we look ahead to the 2032 Games in my home state of Queensland? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I'm excited to say that Australians are taking the to the Paralympics like never before. Host broadcasters, seven, uh, uh, Channel 7's comprehensive coverage has been met with absolutely record ratings. The coverage has reached uh, 2.39 million viewers a day nationally, which is quite extraordinary. And to hear the goalball girls say that they were proud to see their sport on free-to-air television Say, is saying something. Can I thank Channel 7 for its ongoing commitment to the Paralympics? In terms of social media, Australians have also engaged with our para-athletes like never before. Paralympics Australia has reported record levels of social media engagement and presented some truly inspiring stories about our para-athletes. Their journey to Tokyo, Mr President, their, their, their journey beyond and their journey towards Brisbane 2032. Yeah. Senator Cash. Mr President, I now ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Now, order. I've got Senator Birmingham who uh, is requesting the call. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, Mr President. Mr President, I just wish to, uh, to give uh, the Senate and parliamentarians, and in particular uh, parliamentary staff, a very brief update in relation to the implementation of recommendations as they uh, relate and flow from the report of Ms Stephanie Foster, PSM, 
uh, of parliamentary workplaces and in particular the response to serious incidents. Uh, I understand that uh, presiding officers, yourself, Mr. President, uh, and the Speaker uh, are working through the process of making a determination, which will be settled shortly, that would confer upon the Parliamentary Services Commissioner additional functions necessary to give effect to an independent parliamentary workplace complaints mechanism for members of Parliament uh, and, in, most importantly, members of Parliament staff operating under the MOPS Act. Uh, this would provide a mechanism to provide support to staff and parliamentarians in relation to serious incidents and other work health and safety matters, matters and also to provide a mechanism for the reviewing and making of recommendations in relation to complaints about serious incidents involving MOPS Act employees and parliamentarians. Mr President, I want to thank you and the Speaker for your work and cooperation in this important determination forms parts of a range of actions that will be supported by the Parliament and resolutions to be put to the Parliament at our next sitting that will help to ensure these processes uh, are transparent, independent, uh, private where necessary, but also provide full accountability measures as recommended by Ms Foster. Uh, this has been a very cooperative process across the Parliament. I want to acknowledge uh, the role of the opposition in a bipartisan way in working through the construct of these arrangements and the role indeed of minor parties and crossbenchers, all of whom have been constructive as well. Uh, these actions are in addition uh, to the work being undertaken by uh, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins in her independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces and I continue to encourage uh, all members of parliament, all staff, former members of parliament and former staff to engage in that as well as the establishment of the Independent Confidential Trauma-Informed Support Line for Staff and Parliamentarians, 1800 APH SPT, uh, and urge and encourage all to engage in that where necessary and reach out there, as well as the imminent rollout of workplace health and safety training, also recommended by Ms Foster, uh, that the government will be providing and making available to all staff and parliamentarians. Once again, Mr President, thanks to the presiding officers and the opposition uh, parliamentarians across the board uh, for their work and cooperation in the successful implementation of these matters. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I thank Senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Colbeck to questions asked by Senator Keneally and Senator Marielle Smith. Well, what we saw today during question time, if anyone had any doubt of how out of depth the Minister uh, for um, Aged Care, representing the Minister for Health, is in this chamber, it was on full display today. The arrogance of this minister and this government not to heed the warnings of the Australian Medical Association. Who best is able to look out for health professionals, to look at the crisis that our hospitals will be facing if indeed we are open to restrict, uh, releasing the restrictions that we've had thus far? in ensuring that we're keeping Australians safe by having lockdowns and being careful with how we go about managing the rollout of the vaccine, then it was clearly on display today. We have every reason to question this minister, but he has such a glass jaw. He hates to be questioned. This entire government hates to have any scrutiny. Now, we on this side will always, always hold the ministers of the Crown responsible for their actions. This is a minister who fails on every occasion to answer very direct questions. Now, the questions today went to what's happening in New South Wales in particular, but what we know will happen right across this country. If the uh, variant of Delta gets out of hand beyond the borders of New South Wales, then there is a crisis like we have never seen before in this country will hit our hospitals. That is the reality. That's the warning from the Australian Medical Association. I would be taking their advice. 
I, as a minister, would not be suggesting that if the AMA want to uh, talk about modelling, then they should get into that business. I mean, the arrogance, the absolute arrogance. I've never heard anything like it before, which just goes again to the basis of the issue from the very start of this pandemic. This Prime Minister, this Minister for Health, have been unable to have any forward thinking. They learnt nothing from what was happening globally. I mean, like it just didn't fall out of the sky here in Australia, this pandemic. They had plenty of opportunity to put plans in place, but they failed to do that. They failed to provide enough vaccines so that now what we're seeing is the crisis in New South Wales is getting worse potentially because now they want to extend the time for rolling out Pfizer vaccine. Now, it's all very well for the minister to try and deflect and talk about the AZ. Well, I've got to tell you, on this side of the chamber, a lot of us have had it. We've had both vaccines. Happy to have that. And to come into this chamber, the audacity of this Fail Minister to suggest that we are not doing what we should be doing as citizens and as elected members of the Senate and the other place to encourage Australians to get vaccinated is just outrageous. That's desperation from a minister who is out of his depth. It's, it is unbelievable. You know, the Prime Minister first off said, we are all in this together. And then he turned when things had been exposed that he has failed in his job and his responsibility of Prime Minister of this country to want to now lay the blame elsewhere. First off, he wanted to blame all the states for all the lockdowns. Now, every day we have seen, for the last month at least, those on the other side come into this chamber and try and create this illusion that they're the only people that are out there caring for people and making sure that they're vaccinated. Well, that is clearly untrue and it is quite dishonest. It is quite dishonest. There is nobody in this chamber at all, except for one exception who sits on that side of the chamber, that has been raising issues around whether or not people should be vaccinated. It is the government's own backbench, its own backbench that has been out there putting out misinformation about vaccinations in this country. Not anyone on this side of the chamber because we are responsible, because we will always hold this government to account. And for those on that side to come in here and trying to shift the blame, well, the Australian people have no faith whatsoever in Mr Morrison to roll out a vaccination to keep Australians healthy Thank and you, safe. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Madam, Davey. Madam Acting Deputy President. No, it's Senator Davey. Thank Madam you. Madam Deputy President, I seek the call next, please. Uh, I've got Senator uh, Davey on the list, and that's who I've called, Senator Roberts. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Oh, Madam Deputy President, sorry. Um, I, I just find it incredible. Labor, come in here, and today the experts Labor want us to listen to is the AMA. Previously, previously, they want us to listen to other experts. Continually, we get told, listen to the experts, listen to the experts. Well, we have been listening to the experts. We have been listening to the experts since day one. We've listened to ATAGI about the vaccinations. We've listened to the AHPCC about the strength of lockdowns and what we should do. We've listened to the chief medical officers and we've listened to the Doherty Institute, who are experts at modelling and looking at when would be an appropriate time to start focusing on the future. But apparently we've now got to ignore all of them and only listen to the AMA. Well, what a ridiculous concept, Madam Deputy President. because. If we ignored everyone else and only focused on one <coughs> sector of experts, we would find ourselves uh, in, a, in a much worse position. What we do know is that, as a government, by listening to the expert advice, we have been adaptable, 
We have managed to pivot our approach. And yes, we have accepted as a government the early stages of the vaccine rollout did not go to plan. And uh, we could have done better, but hindsight is a wonderful thing. No one could have foreseen the change in advice for the AstraZeneca. No one could have foreseen that. And uh, you, you may laugh, Senator Keneally, but had you had a crystal ball, I would have been impressed. Because no country in the world foresaw that change in advice. And we were not the only country that changed the advice on how and what uh, levels to provide the AstraZeneca without, without talking to your GP. Even at TARG, you always said, if you are confident and comfortable and have spoken to your GP, you can still take AstraZeneca. But that was, that was conveniently ignored by the media. It was conveniently ignored by Labor. And the Prime Minister reminded people that they could sit down with their GP, have the conversation, and if they were comfortable, they could take the AstraZeneca. And so many people across Australia have done that because they're not feasting on fear that is being spread, the vaccine hesitancy that is being spread by people. And I am very grateful to the millions of Australians who've now had over 19 million doses of vaccine, of both AstraZeneca and Pfizer, the two vaccines that are available. We are now getting over 330,000 doses a day into people's arms. It is now taking us less than four days to get a million doses into people's arms. And we are doing that while listening to the advice. We are doing that with our eyes firmly set on the advice of the Doherty Institute. That advice that tells us that we need to look to the future and that when we get to 80 per cent vaccination rates across Australia, we will be in a position to move forward. And I, I, I want to bring to Labor's attention, I mean, this is now being acknowledged by your own side. Senator Kimberley Kitching said, and I quote, I think we are getting to the end of the lockdown era partly because we are doing so well on vaccinations, because Senator Kitching recognises that vaccinations are our road out. Gone are the days of COVID zero. That is not going to happen. Premier Daniel Andrews accepts that that is not going to happen. Senator Kitching accepts that is not going to happen. We need to get these vaccinations out the door. We need to get to 80 per cent so that we can progress on our national pathway post-COVID, because this disease, unfortunately, is with us. Thank you, Senator Davey. Your time has expired. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask these questions in the Senate today because the public hospital system in my home state of South Australia is struggling to cope. This week, we had a major incident alert issued for two South Australian hospitals struggling to cope with pressure on their emergency departments. We've had emergency doctors at the Women's and Children's Hospital who have warned that urgent action was needed before the system fails completely. Everyone in South Australia knows that ramping is at crisis point. We have had record levels of ramping in my state. Every South Australian is aware of that because they are deeply anxious about what's going to happen if they ever need to call an ambulance. And we have had code wipes declared. It is fair to say our system in South Australia is already struggling. So what on earth happens with a further COVID outbreak? What on earth happens when our system is already under pressure? And what happens in the next steps of the national plan in my state of South Australia when we're already seeing these significant issues in our hospital system? I want to be absolutely clear. No one wants to be locked down in South Australia again. 
And no one wants to see the existing lockdowns across our country go a moment longer than they need to. We have been urging the government to do the policy work required so we wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. To get the vaccination rollout on track, speedy and effective, that's what we wanted to see and they bungled it. To fix quarantine because hotels are built for tourists, not for quarantine. These were the things they needed to focus on to avoid the sorts of things we're seeing. And on these two things, the Prime Minister and the Health Minister have deeply failed. So it is not enough. It is not enough for the Minister in his answers today to just ignore me, actually to spend his time shouting at senators <laughs> across the chamber I'm here on remote. I can't even hear the conversation going on. I want an answer to my question, Minister. I want an answer to my question, not to hear you engaging in nonsense with other senators in the chamber. And it's not enough to just say, there will be effects. There will be effects. Yeah, that's the point. That's the point. So how are you going to handle them? What are you going to do in my state of South Australia? People are in my state, they are anxious because of the state of the health system already. And we do not have a widespread spread outbreak of COVID in my state at the moment. We do not. And the health system is already struggling. So what happens if we do? To the federal health minister, what are you doing to ensure South Australians can be kept safe? And it's not enough to make this about Labor, and it's certainly completely unacceptable to suggest any of us are engaging in vaccine hesitancy. I'm getting my jab this week. I can't wait. I cannot wait to be vaccinated because I want to keep my family and my community safe. And I know my colleagues feel the same. Actually, the only people peddling vaccine hesitancy in this place have come from your own backbench. So maybe grab a mirror out, take a good look at them and get them into line instead of coming in here and accusing us of engaging in vaccine hesitancy. It is absolutely nonsense. There are real issues in the healthcare system in my state, real issues in our hospital system, real issues with ramping. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen? This isn't about trying to undermine a plan. It's not about trying to undermine a policy response. No one wants to do that. No one wants this to go a minute longer than it needs to. No one wants the restrictions in my state. No one wants lockdowns. But we do want answers. We want answers from the federal government who is so responsible for what's going on here. He's so responsible for how we're going to see a path through this. And you didn't give me answers today. You didn't give us answers. And that means you didn't give South Australians answers. You didn't answer their anxieties. And you need to. People are worried because you've bungled vaccines, you've bungled quarantine, and they're worried you're going to bungle what comes next in my state of South Australia. It is absolutely unacceptable. And I hope next time I ask a question, you have the decency to answer me properly. Thank you, Senator Smith. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Excuse President. Excuse me, Madam Deputy President. Uh, yes, Senator Could I Robinson. seek the call later, please? Uh, yes, there's an opportunity uh, after the next speaker following um, Senator Scar. Senator Scar, please go on. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I think my friend and colleague Senator Smith from South Australia is being somewhat unfair uh, to the minister in suggesting that the minister did not answer the question which Senator Smith put to the minister. I was listening very carefully, and Senator Colbeck did, in fact, answer the question. And I'll just reiterate a few of the points which Senator Colbeck made in terms of responding to the question from Senator Smith. First, Senator Colbeck referred to the record funding which the federal government has provided to the public health system across this country since the coalition government was elected. And that's, that's on the record. That's on the record. The federal government has provided record funding to the public health system across each and every state in Australia. And it's disingenuous to imply otherwise. And just to underscore that, the Australian government is continuing its record investment in public hospitals, including funding under the 2020-25 National Health Reform Agreement and the National Partnership on COVID-19 Response, with total investment of $135.4 billion 
over five years. Let me just reiterate that number. $135.4 billion. There is no doubt that there is an issue in many of our public hospitals across Australia. There's an issue certainly in my home state of Queensland in terms of ambulance ramping. But I think it's a bit disingenuous to throw bricks at the federal government in that respect because the federal government does not run public hospitals in, under our federation system. Those public hospitals are run by the states. And in my home state of Queensland, all the objective evidence is to the effect that our public health system is not being run at an optimal level. And I believe one of the reasons for that is that the Labor Party in my home state of Queensland doesn't leverage off enough the opportunity, the opportunity for our private sector and our public sector to work together to meet things like waiting times and uh, some of the issues relating to issues like ambulance ramping. And it's a real issue in my home state of Queensland. And it is a concern, a great concern, that what is going to happen as we move through the next phase of dealing with this COVID pandemic. I've got friends who have been long-term paramedics uh, working in the Queensland Ambulance Service, and they tell me that they've never seen morale so low. They've never seen morale so low in the Queensland Ambulance Service as it is under the current state Labor government. So there are real issues that need to be addressed. But Senator Colbeck did address those issues when he answered the question from Senator Smith. <laughs> Senator Colbeck, as well as referring to the national funding provided by the coalition government to our states in terms of public hospital services, also referred to the additional $6 billion in funding to support state and health, state and territory health systems respond to COVID-19 outbreaks. So that funding has been there from the federal government, but the federal government doesn't run our public health system. Uh, those hospitals are actually run by our state governments. Second point uh, I'd like to make in terms of this contribution was, again, I think uh, Senator Polly was quite unfair to Senator Colbeck in terms of uh, his answer to her questions in relation to aged care and the rollout of the vaccine across our aged care services. And again, I want to reiterate these figures. These are important figures. The vaccination rate of workers in our aged care sectors continues to increase. It continues to increase. As at 31 <laughs> August, 82.9 per cent of aged care workers have now received one dose of the vaccine. Over 82 per cent, 82.9 per cent have received at least uh, one dose. And over 61 per cent have received two doses. Over 61 per cent have received two doses. So the vaccination program is going well in terms of making sure our aged care workers are fully vaccinated. And I think also, and, and Minister Colbeck made this point as well, also it has to be recognised that the medical advice, the medical advice changed earlier this year and the program had to pivot so that we weren't vaccinating aged care residents and aged care workers at the same time. Senator Scar, I'm just going to remind you that the taking note questions were moved by um, Senator Polly, but they are indeed um, questions asked by Senator Keneally and Senator Marielle Smith. Sure. Uh, the vaccination rollout, well, curious, Senator Polly should move someone else's questions, but that's, uh, uh, I'll, take that. Scar, I'll take that on. Senator Scar, this is what happens uh, at most take notes. This is what happens at most take notes. I'll, Thank I'll, take, you. Uh, I'll take that on board. I think it's very disingenuous for Senator Keneally to have referred to the hospital ramping as if that oh, was thank something. Thank you, Senator Scar. Thank Your you. time has expired. I'm now going to go to Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, Senator Colbeck's answers to these questions show that he just isn't up to it. He was smug. He was complacent. He was unaware or uninterested in key details. There was no sense of urgency, just a sense of entitlement. He was evasive. Uh, he was tricky about the politics. Now, you may be able to hear that there is an occasional small construction site outside of uh, level 22 of the building that I'm in, <laughs> and they've just, they've just recommenced uh, drilling. So hopefully they stop for the next uh, three and a half minutes uh, or whatever it is. Um, the, the problem, the underlying problem, the underlying problem here 
uh, Madam Deputy President, is that the Prime Minister made a bet that a four or six month delay in vaccine delivery wouldn't matter very much. It's been the most disastrous public policy failure in Australian history, the worst gamble uh, with the worst consequences. Now, it's not clear why the Prime Minister has failed so bad, whether it was his complacency, whether he was influenced by the maddies on his back bench, the ultra-right conspiracy theorists, whether it was his own hostility to public health uh, and active government, or whether he just thought that somehow market forces might resolve the problem for him. You see, when, when Australians are in times of crisis, uh, in times of conflict or pandemic, natural disasters, flood or fire, or economic shock, they look to their Prime Minister. And what have they seen throughout the three years of this Prime Minister's term, whether it's been the bushfires, when he was trying to pretend that he wasn't on holidays in Hawaii, the blame shifting, the hyper politicisation, the big press conferences and announcements with no delivery, yeah. the lectures, the bullying, the uh, conflict with his political opponents. They've seen all these things, but they've seen nothing of substance. And this Prime Minister only hopes that there'll still be people in the press gallery who are prepared to run his lines for him. Australia had a golden opportunity, our geographical isolation, our strong public health system, uh, the fact that we don't have, that we've got, you know, uh, uh, over 100 years of democratic governance. Who would have thought at the beginning of last year that the world would have been able to move so quickly to develop multiple vaccines uh, for the coronavirus. Uh, that what we what we required was a government that was able to take the steps, keeping low to no COVID infections, delivering vaccines up to the 70 and 80 and 90 percent that is required to keep the community safe, and have, then have a safe staged opening up. Well, this prime minister has bungled that opportunity. He has squandered the opportunity that Australia has had. And as a consequence, uh, ordinary people are now paying the price. Long term, long term uh, problems for ordinary people. Nearly 1,300 cases in New South Wales today. Over 1,000 cases every day. Significant parts of the New South Wales population not vaccinated. Uh, significant vulnerable parts, particularly in regional Australia, not vaccinated. Our hospitals under pressure. Pressure on our ICU capability. And endless lockdowns that the Prime Minister wants to blame on the state governments, rather than taking responsibility for the underlying reason for these lockdowns, which is, of course, the Prime Minister's failure to execute an effective vaccine strategy. The Prime Minister's failure to deliver vaccines for Australians to secure vaccine supply. Now, the, the people opposite, senators opposite, may choose to go on with the puerile politics of trying to defend this Prime Minister's abject failure. But we ought to be focused squarely upon it. Uh, we ought to fix it. This, this minister, Senator Colbeck, this government, this Prime Minister, are accountable for that failure, and it's having enormously negative consequences, particularly in my home Thank state you, of Senator New Senator Ayres, your time has expired. Um, I believe Senator Roberts is seeking the call. Uh, Senator Sen Stewart. Deputy President, um, I was going to seek the call. Uh, yes, I to appreciate take, that. Questions and in response to Sarah, have, Sen Senator Hanson-Young. Um, you seeking the call, Senator Wish Wilson and uh, Senator Roberts, and you're both on remote. And I would have to say, uh, on balance, um, mostly this question goes to the Greens, and so uh, there's no other way to call it. I'm calling it for Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, President. But, uh, just a moment, um, Senator Roberts. Um, Senator Seawitz. And I was on my feet straight away to seek leave for Senator Wish Wilson. Yep. 
but there's no one seeking leave for Senator Roberts, and that's my understanding, the process that has to occur. Uh, no, it's not the process. It's, um, senators seek leave in whatever way they can, and I've determined to give it to Senator Roberts. So I'm going to call Senator Roberts. If we have time. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I reference the Attorney General Senator Cash's response to my question on freedom to protest under the body of Australian law. Senator Cash fluffed on about what is in fact a basic element of our democracy. What she seems to have forgotten is that there is an overarching principle here. The right to freedom is a basic inalienable right that our body of law has been formed around. Our laws reflect our Christian heritage and should always do so. Our governing document, our national constitution, for instance, is in its preamble references God. Without being presumptuous, and while I'm not a biblical scholar or a churchgoer, perhaps I should have asked myself earlier than this a fundamental question. What would God do? It turns out that the Bible is quite clear on the issue of freedom. From Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In this epistle, Paul was urging the new churches he had founded in Galatia to stand against those who were trying to subvert the freedom Christianity had given. Paul's epistle to the faithful in Galatia could have been written today. The battle for freedom and darkness exists now as it did 2,000 years ago. We spent 2,000 years writing a body of law to implement Christian principles, including the right to freedom. These freedoms were first enshrined in the Magna Carta, Libertatum, literally the, quote, great charter of freedoms that the head of the church at the time, the Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote in 1215. Our Attorney General has demonstrated not only a lack of understanding of man's laws, she has failed to demonstrate an understanding of God's laws. Being sworn in on the Bible is clearly no guarantee of believing a word of it. While eminent biblical scholars advise that the Bible is properly understood in context, how could the Attorney General not have looked this up at any time in the five months the Senator has occupied her role? Five months of widespread and sustained media and social media conversations around the right to protest and the Attorney General, the highest law officer in the land, was missing in action. Were you not curious about what the law actually said? Let me help out about that in the time remaining. The Magna Carta was written in response to King John exercising his powers using the principle of V ad volantis, which translates as force and will. The making of decisions that were above the law and then using force to create compliance. Much like parliaments around Australia are doing right now. Lord Denning described the Magna Carta as, quote, the greatest constitutional document of all times, the foundation of the freedom of the individual against the arbitrary authority of the despot. I looked through the Magna Carta and I couldn't see the COVID exemption that allows governments to destroy human rights and do whatever they want if they can get the population scared enough to accept it. Because of course, there is no exemption afforded power, mad governments and unelected bureaucrats. In 1948, before the UN turned into the problem, not the solution, the United Nations Charter on Human Rights declared in 1948 a few things on freedom of protest that parliaments around Australia are conveniently ignoring. Article 19, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference. Article 20, everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. Article 21, everyone has a right to participate in the government of their country. This is what protesters are doing, participating in governance, exercising their right to free speech and to free association. That's the very definition of a protest. These are rights that Article 30 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights protects. It binds governments from breaching the declaration. It would appear that the Prime Minister and the Premiers are seeking to wind back our freedom, our right to freedom, to that which existed prior to the year 1215, to give themselves the powers that King John used force to exercise. Would the Attorney General like to take another run at explaining why parliaments in Australia are not in breach of the very principles that define our legal system, the Bible and the Magna Carta, reinforced by the much more recent United Nations Charter on Human Rights? And I wonder what Monica is thinking, languishing in jail, with the promise that she can get out, providing she renounces her membership of a political party. This is Australia 2021.
disgrace. We need our freedoms back. And we need an Attorney General who understands the basics on which our freedoms are based. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Senator Roberts. And I uh, forgot to move um, the motion as moved by Senator Polly to take note of answer, so I'm going to do that now. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Polly to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, against, no. Thank you. Um, that now concludes the business. We'll now move to uh, tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses.